Thank you, Susan. From plume hunters to pesticides to the recovery of the bluebird and bald eagle, Scott Stoner and Denise Hackert Stoner will look at the history of species lost and species saved, conservation heroes and birds whose range has changed in our lifetimes. Their award-winning photography has been widely exhibited in New York State and has appeared in numerous publications. Denise and Scott are longtime avid birders who have served the Hudson Mohawk Bird Club in many capacities. They, pre they present and educate across our state. Welcome, Denise and Scott. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much. Absolutely. Becky, can you hear us okay? Yes, I can hear yes, you very, very well. Fine. Okay, yes. okay great. Well, thank, thank, thank you, Susan and, and Becky, for inviting us, and Becky for the, those kind words of introduction. Let's get uh, just share our screen here and uh, get get right to it. Did that, did that work? Yes, great. Yes, that worked yes, great. That's thank great. you. Wonder, wonderful. Sorry about that. <clears throat> okay. Well, well. Good evening. <clears throat> Sorry. Uh, good evening, everyone. And thank you so much for inviting us. We, we really, really appreciate it. Uh, DOAS is one of our closest neighbor bird clubs. Uh, we certainly birded up at, at Franklin Mountain and, and, we, and we know you do it. It's such a wonderful job with that hawk watch. So it's, again, it's great to be invited back again. And again, we thank you and let's dig into our conservation program here. So, Tonight, we're gonna to start with a brief celebration of the beauty and diversity of birds across our country, and then take a look back 100, 150 years and look at some of the birds that we've lost, some of the birds that we were losing and how that spurred early 20th century conservation actions. These actions did provide considerable protection, but then other threats completely unexpected emerged roughly in the 1950s, 1960s, which challenged us and birds once again. And then just as we were finishing celebrating the year of the bird in 2018, the 100th year anniversary of the Migratory Bird Treaty Act, we were hit with new warnings about steep declines in bird populations, even among common species. So, so more challenges, but we do remain hopeful that these two can be overcome. So why, why do we care about birds? I, I think we, I think we all know the answers. I think we, I think we all um, you know, share share the interest and 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 share the concerns. The you know, whether we enjoy birds in our own yards or travel far afield, chasing rarities and looking for new life birds. We all love birds. Birds are part of our lives and part of our planet. We as a nation have a mixed history about birds from practices that have put birds in jeopardy to landmark efforts to protect birds and their habitats. Birds are litmus tests for environmental damage. Uh, i.e. the canaries in the coal mines. And selfishly, no birds, no birding, no birders. So, so let's just take a kind of a quick tour across the country and, and just celebrate the beauty and diversity of birds across America. Starting, starting locally with our lovely Northern Cardinal, our state bird, the Eastern Bluebird, the Eastern Screech Owl, and up in, in Washington County, in the grasslands, one of our most endangered habitats of the short-eared owl, pine grosbeak, Ruddy turnstone along the beaches of Long Island. Rosie, looking down to Florida, Rosie at Spoonbill. 
and the Anhinga, which we see down in the Everglades. We'll talk a lot about the Everglades tonight. Took that word se seven minutes to get that fish down. A McGee Marsh in, in Ohio, spring migration, stop, stop off before crossing Lake Erie, Magnolia Warbler. Down in the lower Rio Grande Valley of Texas, least grebe, common paraki, and buff bellied hummingbird. The grasslands of Colorado, again, the, the, the grasslands, the prairies, very endangered habitats. Here, greater prairie chicken. And in the lovely Southwest, vermilion flycatcher, elf owl, our smallest owl, and the Paraloxia, kind of the, the desert cardinal, so to speak, or the Western counterpart uh, to our cardinal. Burrowing owl, roadrunner, here in Death Valley National Park. The coast of California, birds such as black oyster catcher. And way up in Nome, Alaska, the lovely Aleutian Turn. And out in Hawaii, the EEV. Birds are beautiful and birds have been part of at least my life since, since I was a child growing up on, on Long Island. But now let's switch our focus and take a look at some of the birds that we have sadly lost and some of the birds that we have fortunately been able to save. We know that extinction is, is, is forever and these are some of the birds that, that we have sadly said goodbye to. Uh, the great auk and Labrador duck in the 1800s the great auk, a big flightless alcid that was just uh, that was taken by sailors, used for <clears throat> food. Their eggs were eaten. Even the bodies were were burned for fuel. They had a lot of very oily, um, oily bodies. The Labrador duck. <clears throat> people are not sure really what happened to it, other than it's gone. The passenger pigeon and Carolina parakeet in the early 1900s. We'll talk more about the passenger pigeon in a moment. And then in just this past year, uh, the Bachman's warbler and ivory bill woodpecker were declared extinct, at least as a draft out, out for public comment. So the, the passenger pigeon, um, as you know, a very, very, sad chapter in our nation's history. There were billions and billions of passenger pigeons, as many as six billion birds. They, they, they flew over in great flocks, darkening the skies, blocking out the sun, taking hours for a flock to pass over. They were the most abundant bird in North America. Nesting birds filled entire forests, but sadly, they were shot and shot and shot. They were hunted relentlessly by the commercial pigeon industry. They were also trapped. The roots, the roosts rather, were torched. They were asphyxiated with burning sulfur, attacked with rakes, attacked with pitchforks, and attacked even with potatoes, and they were poisoned. Fi finally, the population became unviable. Not, not enough to keep it going. And then suddenly they were gone. In a short period of time, billions of passenger pigeons gone down to zero, down to none. And the only ones that remained are, the, are in museum drawers and display cases, a sad and scary reminder of how quickly an entire species can be lost. The slaughter and extinction of this, one abu this once abundant bird 
was a driving factor for the fledgling conservation movement in the early 1900s. So the early 1900s was really a turning point. And it wasn't, it wasn't just the passenger pigeon. It was a, there were a lot of things going on then. Bird feather, <clears throat> sorry, bird feather hats were all the rage and wading birds were being killed by the millions for their plume feathers. Some hats even contained entire birds. Hats made of, or hats adorned with feathers and, and, and birds were high fashion among wealthy women and the birds were paying the price for it. Down in, down in what's now the Everglades, Everglades National Park, in Florida Bay, plume hunters went out after the birds who were nesting in offshore island rookeries. And some, some of these rookeries were out in Florida Bay. By 1900, over 5 million birds were being slaughtered every year for, for their plume feathers. The feathers were more valuable by weight than gold. National Audubon Society was formed to protect birds from plume hunting and selected the, the egret as its symbol. So the, the plume hunters went out to the rookeries, shot, shot the egrets to collect the plumes, so they, they shot the adults, and the young were left to die. And then, and then we have Warden Guy Bradley, hired by the Audubon Society and deputized by the Monroe County Sheriff's Office down in Florida in 1902, Guy Bradley, himself a former plume hunter, worked to protect the wading birds from plume hunting. <clears throat> On July 8th, 1905, at age 35, Guy Bradley confronted the plume hunters at a workery in Florida Bay and attempted to arrest them. <clears throat> However, Guy Bradley was shot and killed. The plume hunters were acquitted of, of murder, but he became a martyr, bringing attention to the, uh, to the plight of the birds. The popularity of the bird hats declined and, and the egrets were saved. And now, more than a century later, we walk along the Guy Bradley Trail along Florida Bay in the Everglades in honor of his memory. So around the same time, the US designated its first national wildlife refuge. And this is a small island, three acres, Pelican Island, off the east coast of Florida. It was set aside by President Roosevelt, Teddy Roosevelt, to protect birds and other, or, I'm sorry, to protect egrets and other birds from the plume hunters. He created more than 50 such refuges. And, and created the National Wildlife Refuge System, which is now comprised of about 570 National Wildlife Refuges. <clears throat> so again, more, more things happening again at the turn of the century, of the last century. Christmas bird counts began and they, they were started by Audubon as a, an alternative to what they called the Christmas side hunt, where people got together, chose sides, and competed by, to see which, <laughs> which side, which group could go out and kill the most birds and mammals in one day. As, so Audubon, um, the Audubon Society, uh, uh, specifically Frank Chapman, an officer in National Audubon, proposed this alternate holiday tradition of the Christmas bird count to count live birds instead of killing them. The first year, as you can see, uh, began with only 25 count circles, 27 birders and 90 species. Several of those initial counts were right here in New York state. Now it's a major, as you know, a major international effort and the longest running ornithological database, which is a tremendous, tremendous resource for, for, for researchers today. 
And so in the in the in the years after the passenger pigeons demise, the, the few years there, several pieces of legislation were enacted. But the, probably the most comprehensive was the Migratory Bird Treaty Act of 2018. It has survived, not without a few bumps in the road. And we celebrated its centennial anniversary just four years ago with what was called the Year of the Bird. The Migratory Bird Treaty Act made it unlawful to pursue, hunt, take, capture, kill, possess, sell, purchase, barter, import, export, or transport any, <clears throat> sorry, any migratory bird. And migratory bird was defined very broadly. So this, so this uh, Migratory Bird Treaty Act protects nearly all native birds in the US. Not starlings, not house sparrows, but pretty much all, all, all native birds. And it, is actually, it has saved many millions of birds and several entire species. It provided a lot of protection to the trumpeter swan which had nearly gone extinct by 1900, again, hunting and feather collecting for hats and also for quill pens, writing quills. So it, it, took, it took a while, but the, the trumpeter swan has, has recovered. And you know, although it's not still without risk, but it, it, it is doing a lot better. So a few of the species specifically noted as, as saved are the snowy egret, the wood duck, and the sandhill crane. So with the Migratory Bird Treaty Act in, in place, birds were protected and everything was okay, right? We didn't have to worry about birds anymore. The, the, they're all safe, right? Um, <clears throat> unfortunately, not. Um, so just because a bird was protected didn't mean that, that it was protected from all hazards, um, many of which were unknown at the time of the, that the act was, uh, was adopted. And similarly, just because a place such as Everglades National Park is, is protected, doesn't mean that it's safe from influences beyond its borders. So the weight, let's look at the wading birds in the Everglades, which, which were down 93% since the 1930s. Uh, so the, the Everglades, and this, so we have the original Everglades on the left and, and the, you know, fairly current Everglades on, <clears throat> on, on the right, the, with the park being in the lower third of, of, of this, uh, Florida Bay being at the very bottom. <clears throat> so the, the Everglades are very vulnerable to influences beyond the park boundary, particularly north of it, because there's this flow of, the, this flow of water through the sawgrass for Marjorie Stoneman Douglas, another conservation hero, led to the uh, protection of Everglades National Park. She described it as river of grass. The water is the, is the lifeblood of the Everglades, but they're at the end of this river. So, so the Everglades are vulnerable to whatever happens to the water north of the park because it's, as it's, as it's heading towards the park. Some of it is cut off. Some of it is used for other things. The quality of it can be degraded. And, and again, in the Everglades, it's all about the water. And much, as I mentioned, much, much of the flow of water in, into the park has been blocked off and diverted. And for the wading birds in South Florida, again, the success, it's all about the water. But, it, but it's not just, is there enough water, but you need the right amount of water at the right time, the, in the right place, and of the right quality. Let's take a look at, at an example. Marjorie Stoneman Douglas famously said, 
that the Everglades is a test. And if we pass it, we get to keep the planet. The wood stork is an indicator species of how well the Everglades and we are, are doing with that. The wood stork is one of those wading birds that's part of that 93% uh, decline. Wood, wood storks, they, they, they need a lot of food. They need 440 pounds of food in a nesting season. And they're touch feeders and they need the food to be concentrated so, so, um, so they get enough, so they can get enough food during the breeding season. So, the, so they actually need for the Everglades to be sort of drying out in that in their nesting season so that the food is, is concentrated in these pools so they can get enough. And if there's, if there's not enough, if they don't get enough food, if the water levels are not just right, they don't get enough food and the nests fail and a breeding season is, is lost. There is some, some progress. Some parts of the Tamiami Trail, this is US 41, which goes along the northern edge of the park between Naples and, and uh, Miami. But some parts of this have been elevated to restore some of the normal flow of water into the park. The wood stork is no longer an endangered species. However, it is still threatened. And the Everglades ecosystem is, however, still endangered. So the fate of the wood stork and the Everglades remains very much up to us. Just a couple of updates on some of the wading birds. Uh, spoonbills, the numbers are fairly stable, 200 to 400 nests out in, in Florida Bay, but still much below the historic numbers. Great egrets are still down, but the overall nesting numbers of wading birds is improving and this was based on 2020 numbers from Audubon, Florida. Um, so it is, it did improve, it, ha it has improved compared to the 1980s and 1990s, but it's still down compared to historic numbers. Uh, the restorations are making a positive impact and they must continue, but climate change is also a factor, a negative factor, resulting in changes in seasonal rainfall patterns. So another, an, another threat was becoming apparent around 1960. The robins were dying and bald eagle nests were failing due to thinning eggshells. The eggs were being crushed in the nest. Rachel Carson wrote about this in Silent Spring in 1962. This was an, another a huge wake up call that everything was not okay. So a little, a little background here, malaria was, was widespread and a leading cause of human death. And Dutch elm disease was introduced in the US in the 1930s. The DDT was seen as a solution to both problems. However, an unintended consequence, DDT was, was killing birds. So, hidden, so the hidden dangers of this were, were exposed. And briefly, here's, here's kind of how it worked. So the elm trees were sick. They were sprayed with DDT. Got into the, it was on the leaves. The leaves, fell, the leaves fell to the ground in the fall. Earthworms fed in the leaf litter. And the DDT then concentrated in the earthworms. Next spring, robins ate, ate the earthworms and the robins died. Again, uh, an unintended consequence of, of the pesticide of DDT. Uh, <clears throat> DDT also affected the bird, some predators who, who ate the land birds. For example, the peregrine falcon, it, it went to the brink of extinction 
And this was this was because the DDT the, the, the DDT was in was in birds, smaller birds that ate insects and seeds that were contaminated with DDT. So it went, it moved up the food chain from the seeds and the insects to the to the smaller to the songbirds and then into the falcons. And it caused the the falcons to have uh, overly thin eggshells and, and affected their reproduction. And, and, the, and the falcon was in a, a serious risk of extermination. And DDT affected fish eating or perseverous birds as, as well. So our national symbol was, was on the brink. So it's kind of similar story to the way it got into the, the robins, the DDT, it was used to control mosquitoes, it got into the water, fish were contaminated, the eagles ate the contaminated fish, DDT interfered with eggshell production, and the thin eggshells broke or failed to hatch. They refer to it as omelets in, in the nest. They, the, um, and the bald eagle population um, really, really sank down. Some other factors for, for their decline, habitat loss, uh, shooting of eagles, and lead poisoning. Fortunately, uh, the eagle has recovered. DDT was banned. It was protected as an endangered species. And now we're, um, we're over 10,000 breeding pairs and it's off the endangered species list. It's, it is, however, the eagles, however, still are protected by the Migratory Bird Treaty Act and the, the Bald and Golden Eagle Protection Act. Sim, similar to the eagles, uh, ospreys and brown pelicans were affected by DDT eggshell thinning. And I'm going to turn it over to Denise to discuss some other species and other and other challenges. Thanks, Scott. <clears throat> okay. So, with DDT banned, the birds exposed to it via the food chain were recovering, but other species have been facing other challenges. Um, one of those species is the beautiful little shorebird, the piping plover. So the piping plover was very common in the 1800s. Um, but as you heard about other birds during that time, the late 1800s, early 1900s, they were extensively um, hunted for their feathers for hats. Um, I would imagine those feathers would have been very small for hats, but anyway, they were, they were hunted. Um, eventually they were protected by the Migratory Bird Treaty Act and they did recover. Um, however, um, they did again begin to decline after 1945. Um, and the reason for that is that the beaches that attract piping plovers also attract humans. And people began, after the war, people began more and more to um, build along beachside um, areas and develop, develop those areas. With, um, with housing and, and other buildings. Um, so with more people at the beaches, um, people accidentally might step on the inconspicuous little nest of the piping clover or accidentally drive over it. Um, clovers were also just stressed by the presence of humans and often would desert their nests. Also dogs running around the beach, feral cats on the beach. Um, all of these were, 
very, um, very, very uh, negative impact on the piping clover. So today, um, the piping clover is still not in, in very good shape. The Great Lakes um, population of piping clovers is listed as endangered. Um, along the Atlantic, those populations are listed as threatened, but neither is a good um, designation. So some of the actions that are being taken to, um, to protect them, because I mean, once, once the numbers of a population drops low enough to um, warrant listing, um, they then become, avail they then become um, able to receive governmental protection. So um, some of the beaches along the seashore are completely closed um, during the nesting season, like the beaches along Plum Island in Massachusetts. Or otherwise, if they're open, at least exclosures like um, wire exclosures can be placed around known nests, um, protecting those nests and the plovers on them. So, you know, those are some, some actions that are being taken um, by the Fish and Wildlife Service. Um, right now to try to help turn the tide for the little piping clover. Another bird that we'd like to focus on um, is the red knot. Um, the red knot, as you guys probably know, is, is a really great example of just the harrowing adventure um, that long distance migrants undertake. Um, and it's also an example of how vital reliable stopovers are for these birds during their migration. Um, the bir these birds in particular, the, pipe, the red knot, sorry, um, undergoes a very, very long migration, 10,000 10, mile flight from the Southern tip of South America to their Arctic breeding grounds. Um, they, along the way, they lose about half of their body weight during this journey. Um, and as a result, um, about, you know, halfway up <laughs> the, uh, the coast, they really need a reliable um, spot to, to rest and to replenish uh, their weight. Um, and historically, the, the spot along which they stop is the Delaware Bay shore. Um, along the New Jersey, uh, along New Jersey, um, to regain, you know, they stop there to regain their strength and their weight. Um, as you can see, they they arrive in large numbers. So the value of the Delaware Bay Shore as a stopover site is that it's also the egg laying site of the horseshoe crab. And in one of the wonders of coevolutionary timing, the egg laying of the um, horseshoe crabs just perfectly coincides with the arrival of the red knot, just when the red knots most need the food. So this is their last feeding stop before continuing their long journey to the Canadian Arctic, where they're going to also face a number of weeks of frozen landscape before the di their diet of insects becomes available. So they really, really need this nourishment. The horseshoe egg feast doubles the weight of the red knot during their stopover and their successful nesting that season and often their very survival of the individual depends on that stopover. There are over 400 species of other birds and shorebirds that partake of the horseshoe crab feast. And of those, at least 11 species depend specifically on the eggs of the horseshoe crab. Some of those are, in addition to the red knot, the ruddy turnstone, semi-palmated sandpiper, sanderling, dunlin, short-billed dowager. All of those species have declined since the turn of this century. And the red knot has declined by 
overall, this is according to Delaware Riverkeeper. So the problem is that the human demands on the horseshoe crab, whose eggs you see up there in the top photo, um, particularly from the eel and the conch uh, fisheries, as well as the health industry, which uses their, the blood of the horseshoe crab in medical re research. In fact, the blood is used in the development of vaccines. So this is a very current <laughs> issue, um, again, of unintended consequences. This is certainly not arguing against the development of vaccines here, <laughs> but, um, but it is a, a, an unintended consequence of that. Um, and overall, because of all of these stressors, um, the numbers of this vital resource have greatly diminished. Um, it's just had this devastating effect on the red knot population. Um, so it's, it's decreased by 75% since the 1990s. So that's not that long. Um, it's now listed as a threatened species by the US Fish and Wildlife Service under the Endangered Species Act. Um, so we are hoping that as you know, now that it is listed that perhaps some actions can also be taken in its regard as well. Um, here we see um, a beach along, along the Delaware Bay shore in New Jersey um, where some environmental protections have, have been set up. At least the beaches are uh, cleared of people. You can see the people watching from afar um, to where the knots and other shorebirds are feeding along uh, the shore where there are still what appears to be a lot of <laughs> horseshoe eggs, um, but obviously more has to be done to protect the horseshoe crab and thus protect the red knots. The common loon, the, the symbol of the, the great uh, north, So the, the loon is, as we know, a fish eater. So as such, it's at the top of its food chain there on, on Adirondack Lakes. And it's a key indicator of the health of the environment. Loons are vulnerable to lead, to mercury, acid rain, and disease. Also disturbance by boats on these lakes um, and shoreline activities, boat wakes, um, people approaching too closely in their, even in their canoes and kayaks can, can frighten these birds away from their, their nests. Right now, the population of loons is fairly stable, but what about the future? We certainly hope that they remain safe. As Scott mentioned earlier, um, one of our most really um, impacted um, habitats and one of our habitats that's most endangered are, are grasslands really throughout the country. Um, and grassland habitat here in New York has put short-eared owls like this one and other grassland birds in danger. The New York DEC has a species of greatest conservation need list. It's a nine page list. It's a lot of species. Um, it was revised in 2014 and these birds are all high priority for conservation. They're not necessarily endangered or threatened at this time, but um, it's been noted that their population decline or expected decline will require conservation actions in order to keep their, their population stable in the future. So New York State is working hard to, um, to protect these birds. <coughs> Sorry, some of the birds um, included in this grassland study were uh, bobolink, eastern meadowlark, Henslow sparrow, horned lark, the short-eared owl, of course, 
Vesper Sparrow Upland Sandpiper. And if you're interested in seeing more about that study, um, you can check it out on the DEC website. Henslow Sparrow, another um, threatened bird in New York State. And again, you know, the, the numbers are decreasing mainly because of loss of grassland habitat. <clears throat> so another one of our birds that we're very concerned about is the, what we call the uncommon common nighthawk. They've been in steep decline, um, as you can see from the, uh, from the slide here, 61% um, from 1966 to 2014. Um, causes for the decline of this bird are very poorly documented, um, but some of the suggestions include loss of habitat again, um, use of pesticides. I mean, this bird is strictly an insect eater, so. Um, pesticides are, are impacting its, its diet. Um, urban populations of crows, which eat the eggs of city nighthawks, and collisions with cars. Um, in urban settings now, uh, nighthawks often nest on flat gravel roofs instead of the typical ground locations for the species. So let's move on to, to some of the threats facing seabirds. Um, the picture on the lower right here um, is a, it was kind of a, a, a beach uh, sculpture put together of um, trash, plastic trash that was uh, taken out of the ocean, taken, you know, washed up on the shore. Um, plastic garbage has been found lining the nests and in the stomachs of seabirds in some of the remotest places in the North and South Pacific. From plastic stir sticks to party balloons, styrofoam coffee cups, cigarette lighters, plastic is ingested by seabirds who mistake them for food sources or ingest them along with food located among the plastic debris. Even diving birds like the tufted puffin have been found to have plastic in their stomachs. So the plastic is even affecting birds that feed down way below the surface. And as the plastics break down into microscopic tiny bits, the chemicals that they contain are still toxic to the birds that ingest them. So um, just an, another threat to a very, very important and and valued um, group of birds are, are beautiful and majestic seabirds. Um, now Scott is going to, um, I'm gonna turn it over to Scott for some discussion of range changes. Thank, th thank you, Denise. Yeah, I'm gonna do just a tiny bit on, on range changes. We can handle more in the, in, in the Q and A. Just just in the kind of keeping it big picture in interest of time. And then I'm gonna go on and talk about some of the recent findings, or re recent reports about bird population declines. So the kind of in our, in our lifetime, and in some cases a, a bit, yeah, a, a bit uh, longer than our, our lifetimes, we've been seeing number, number of birds expanding their ranges northward uh, particularly here in, in the Northeast. And, and for example, the, the, the black vulture used to, used to just be a bird of the, more of, of the South. And now we have them both, in, uh, we really have them year round in the capital region. I mean, we get them on the, on the Schenectady County Christmas count every, every year. You know, the, the, the Cardinal had, expanded its range up uh, a number of decades ago, um, as did the, the Northern Mockingbird. The Mockingbird possibly due to the 
um, ex expansion of the planting of the uh, multi-floor rows. Just a, a, a couple of really kind of personal observations. The, the, um, the Carolina wren used to think of it as a bird of the, of the mid-Atlantic, but we have one or two at our, at our feeder all year, all year, including some of the coldest days of, of, of the winter. So that's, that's you know, something that we've just, just sort of anecdotally observed over the past uh, couple of decades. And the tufted titmouse, I, you know, growing up a, a young, young person exposed to birds and birding on, on Long Island, when I was, I think, 13 years old, someone in our town had the, the area's first tufted titmouse, and we all um, went over to see it. And you know, now, now they're common. Um, and the red-bellied woodpecker, uh, same, same thing. A neighbor had a red-bellied woodpecker coming. My dad and I went, and went to see it. And now red bellies are all over the place. So some, so some of the reasons are not well known, kind of, spec, kind of speculated at, but, but it seems unlikely that uh, climate change is not a factor, at least in some of these. So, so now, so now, so now we go to kind of go to the end of 2018, and we just finished celebrating the year of the bird, the uh, the, the 100 year anniversary of the Migratory Bird Treaty Act, and and all the conservation successes that that everybody worked so hard to to achieve over, over the past 100 years, and 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 suddenly comes this this report. In, in, the, in the fall of 2019, three billion birds are gone. Three, three billion birds were lost in 50 years since 1970. Nearly 30% of the birds, more than one in four birds, gone. And this was a major study by the Cornell Lab and, 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 and multiple other uh, collaborators. And they looked at data for 529 species across the continental US and, and, and Canada. Really the, it's kind of roughly the, 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 the more common, the more populous birds. Um, and, they, but they, and they found just these staggering losses in, in just 50 years. And you know some of the some of the greatest losses were in some of the more common birds. And and just a, a just a couple of examples here. Some just some excerpts of, of this. Um, you know, grassland birds. You know, Denise talked about them too. Down fifty three percent. Birds you know birds like like the bottle. Like I don't know its, it's exact numbers. Right here, but but one of the but grassland birds, half the grassland birds gone. A third of the shorebirds gone. A third of the boreal forest birds gone. And losses in the Arctic tundra, eastern forest, and also western forest birds. And just a, and a, a, a few common birds. Baltimore Orioles, one in three gone. White-throated sparrow, one in three, gone. Juncos, dark-eyed juncos, also one in three, gone. And the American Bird Conservancy, using some of the same or some of the trend data that that Cornell study used, did, did uh, their own analysis, and they identified five species with the steepest declines. King rail issues were have a uh, loss of habitat. Um, chestnut collared longspur habitat loss. It's a grassland bird. Again, the group showing the greatest decline. Habitat loss, 
habitat fragmentation. Bank, bank swallow and, and in the Western US black swift down 89%. Um, you know, causes are not not absolutely certain, but maybe due to decline of insects they feed on um, because of pesticide use. And most of all, the evening glow speak down ninety percent. So this this one is kind of personal to to me. This is one of the one one of the birds that most interested me as a as a young young birder on, on Long Island, we would get evening ghost beaks at our feeders in, in, in the winter. And they were they were they were big and they were beautiful and they were and we could get get fairly close to them and get pictures of them and and they're just one of my favorite birds. And now in the last 30 or so years living living upstate, I, I think I've seen them maybe three times. I mean, where, where did they go? And, <clears throat> and it, it's, it's kind of a mystery because there really isn't a lot of habitat loss. They, the, the forests, the coniferous and mixed forests are still there. They do feed on spruce budworms, which are cyclical, but the decline has been steady. So, I don't know, I'm, I'm really concerned about this bird. And, you know, talking about the, uh, the, com the common birds dropping off, um, and you know, this is one that was pegged in that uh, Cornell study. Uh, will you know, the red-winged blackbird, will it go the way of, of the passenger pigeon? A third of the red-winged blackbirds are gone in, in 50 years. Uh, granted, they, they weren't starting at 6 billion. They're starting at 260 million. But it's a, still, it's a common bird with severe losses. And you know, are we at risk of losing common species like this? But more bad news in 2019. Um, <clears throat> a report out of uh, National Audubon that two thirds of the bird species are at risk of extinction due to climate change. And the, the bobolink could lose almost 90% of its, of its range, but there is barely still, still time as um, <clears throat> if we can stabilize carbon emissions and hold warming to one and a half degrees, uh, at least some of these birds can be protected at least from climate related extinction. So just to, to kind of wrap it up before I turn it over to Denise to, to finish on some, good, some better news. The um, just a few updates from this, just this past year. A study in Europe kind of um, corroborated the findings in North America. Uh, they they looked at forty years and found a twenty percent decline. You no, know, we, we looked at in, in the U.S. that looked at fifty years and a thirty percent decline. So pretty pretty similar. Um, a Fish and Wildlife report found that. Again, half the shorebirds, half the grassland birds are of conservation concern. It's similar, similar numbers to, to, the other, to the other findings. The lesser prairie chicken, the bird of the, the, the plains of Colorado listed as endangered. The ivory bill and others declared extinct. One, one good piece, one piece of good news, the uh, the weakening, the the, uh, the Migratory Bird Treaty Act. The, the, the past year, they restored some protection that was taken away from it uh, in the previous uh, few years. So one one 
one piece of good news in there. So just, um, you know, the, um, the birds proposed to be declared extinct included the average built woodpecker, habitat loss collection, and we think there's probably a lot of public comment received about, about this. A lot of people think that it's too early to declare it extinct. It's very hard to prove the negative. And some people think that additional time to study, study the habitats, protect the habitats might be warranted. We'll see what the, the final decision from the Fish and Wildlife Service is. So Denise, I'm just going to turn it back to Denise who is going to wrap it up very quickly. Here. Yes, <laughs> I will be very quick. <laughs> Um, so just uh, recur reviewing the, the current threats that we've been through, um, just the reasons for the declines, habitat loss and degradation, climate change, pesticides. We didn't specifically say window collisions, but that does, um, that does definitely factor in. And, uh, and other collisions, like collisions with cars, power lines, um, collisions with communication towers, collisions with wind turbines. So there are millions of birds that are lost, multi-millions of birds that are lost in collisions. But if you, if you look at this last factor, cats, feral and house cats that are out, outdoors, 2.4 billion birds per year, more than all of the collisions combined. Um, are killed by cats. So what can we do as you know, individuals? We can keep our cats indoors. Uh, we can try to protect them from hitting our windows. And there's various ways that we, you know, can do that as, as backyard birders. Um, we can reduce our lawns. We can landscape with native plants as much as possible. Um, we can avoid using pesticides on our own property. We can keep watching birds. We can encourage other people, especially young people, to watch birds. Children are the future uh, environmentalists, and they will not become they will not. Come become protectors of birds unless they learn to love birds when they're young. Um, we can join um, in citizen science projects like the Christmas Bird Counts, Project Feeder Watch, um, eBird uh, reporting, just to keep data current on, on, on um, numbers of birds. We can advocate for conservation politically. So these are some things that that we can do. And some birds are doing well. We have invested in conservation in the past and it has paid off. Raptors, for instance, are up 200%. We talked about the fal peregrine falcon and the, and the eagles. These are huge success stories. Turkeys are up 200%. Waterfowl in general is up 50%. So if we invest in others, we know that we've done it before, we should be able to do it again. So we've seen some of the success stories tonight. Robins are doing well, bald eagles off the endangered species list. Wood storks, osprey and peregrine falcons bounced back. The trumpeter swan has recovered. So we knew that we know that some of these species and groups are doing well and our state bird um, the eastern bluebird is once again thriving. That was on. That was a bird that was on the brink. A combination of the rise of use of pesticides and um, increase of urbanization and taking out of woodlots and and destroying their habitat um, was really putting this bird in in very very uh, bad a very bad way until. You know, the Bluebird Society came in and, and started their, their nest box project. Um, you can see these nest box along, along uh, Route 20, all the way out west. 
Um, and that has brought the, um, the Eastern Bluebird back. The population is growing. Um, there's been a 70% increase from 1980 to, um, to 2005. So we know we can do it. Um, We've been, we've answered the call before, we can, we can do this. And so we just need determination and dedication to continue. And at eight minutes beyond our, <laughs> the time we should have ended, <laughs> we are done. And we thank you so much for listening for that long hour. And we'll be happy to try to answer any questions that may have come through on the chat. I have a question that I would like to address to you. Um, have rules changed in recent years to require the horseshoe crab blood harvesting for live harvest and release? And from what this person understands, that can be done safely and without harm to the crab. I know that I'm not sure that any rules have been changed. I can't say that for sure, but I do know that, they, that there is a bleeding um, program where they, they bleed the animals and then release them. The problem with it is that they're weakened. So, I mean, depending on how much blood is taken, I guess, but the, it does weaken the crabs and not all of them survive. And the ones that do may not be able to nest successfully or, or lay, lay eggs successfully. So it's a mixed bag, but it's certainly better than just outright killing them. So, yeah. Thank, Thank you. you. Mm -hmm. About the threat to birds posed by wind turbines and also possibly solar farms. Um, well, wind. I mean, if you wind, wind. I think it was 0.2 million, and you know, and you know, again, you know, cats, two two billion. So you know, yes, there are there are some some bird losses. Uh, from from wind, but it's a lot less than many many other um, other factors that that do uh, cause the death of birds. And so solar, uh, I have heard something about it, and I I don't have any any figures off the top of my head about that. So certainly something to to ask about. So. Um, regarding domesticated outdoor cats, has there ever been a push to curb their predation of birds with a public awareness campaign? I really don't know, but that would really be a great, a great idea. Yeah. Um, I mean, we've seen it in other programs, you know, where, where people have pointed out, um, and we point it out frequently in almost every program we give <laughs> about birds and backyard birding. Um, yeah. But you know that's that's about the extent of public uh, <laughs> notice that uh, that I'm aware of. I, I think it would be a, a, a great thing if bird clubs and Audubon chapters all across the country stressed in, in their own outreach. So yeah. Thank you. Sure. You had mentioned earlier the Migratory Treaty Act mm -hmm. and how it protects people from birds from being killed by people. Someone was asking, does it also forbid you to possess things like bird nests or feathers or stuff like that? Uh, yes, yes, so it's forbidden to to possess birds or any part thereof. Yes. One more question. Is it true that a large amount of bluebirds died last winter in the Texas freeze? Hmm. Did you hear that? I know, I know there are kind of sudden and, and at least initially unexplained die-offs of, of, of birds in, ver in various parts of the country. Um, that's, that's a good question. I'll, I'll, I'll look into that. But I, I, I'm not yeah. sure right off uh, off the top of my head. So yeah, thank you. Sure. Mm. I have one last question here sure. too, and that would be: you mentioned that a number of birds have expanded their ranges northward. Are mm -hmm. there any species that are expanding ranges 
southward from the north. I'm not sure. I mean, we have eruptions of north, you know, northern yeah. birds that come in um, some years, like the crossbills and the, you know, the pine grove speaks and, but those aren't so much range expansion as temporary eruptions. There are, um, there are some, some birds that will expand northward and then contract like the um, Carolina wren, which will, will expand northward and then a very severe winter can, can just, you know, um, cause a contraction of that <laughs> expansion. And it, it might appear that they're, you know, migrating south, but actually their, their range is just kind of contracting. But as far as any real expansion south, I'm not aware of any other yeah, than I'm, the eruptions. I'm, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm not either, but. Um, yeah. And there's a comment saying cardinals expanding south and west. And I was one, one listener just texted me suggesting the Merlin is such a bird. Oh, that's expanding south? Yes. Oh, I, and I also have a uh, comment from co-president Andy Mason. Ra wow. ravens, have, ravens have extended south. Oh, yeah. Great. Yeah. I, I, know, I know ravens have, have expanded to lower lower altitudes here in the capital region. We used to just see them up at uh, places like Thatcher, Thatcher Park. And now we're seeing them in more the uh, the, the lowlands uh, of, of the capital region. So, so that's sort of, there may be an altitudinal mm. um, range expansion too, so. Mm. Well, Scott and Denise, we thank you very much for your presentation tonight. Um, we had, over 60 participants here. I'm sure everyone enjoyed it very much. Uh, to close tonight, I'd just like to remind folks about our optics raffle. Um, you can win great prizes for just $15 and there's only 250 tickets that will be sold. Thank you everyone for attending and good night. Thank good you. Night. Thank, thank you very much. Thanks for having us, good night.